Thanks, Glenn. Um, I know Rick and I really appreciate all the support and help that you've given to us to do all the technology to make uh, this conversation possible. So hi, everyone. As uh, Glenn said, I'm Maxine, and I use the pronouns she, her. Along with Carmen Paquette, I am co-chair of the OSPN Long-Term Care Committee. Our main objective thus far has been to create an organizational assessment checklist, which we call the LGBTQ Friendly Good Practices Checklist that can be used, we hope, by long-term care homes and perhaps even other organizations. If you would like a copy of the checklist, you can email me at ltccospn, that's the initials for Long-Term Care Committee, OSPN, at gmail.com. We, uh, we have as a committee participated in the long-term care submission to the Long-Term Care Commission. We've also participated in various community meetings and presented on long-term care issues uh, as it pertains to the senior LGBTQ community. <clears throat> in line with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and in the spirit of reconciliation, I wanna begin this presentation by acknowledging the land on which this session was organized. We are located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. The Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to be present on this territory. As settlers, we need to recognize the contribution and historic importance of indigenous peoples and to recognize that our standard of living is directly related to the resources of indigenous people. As a settler, my own personal commitment is to continually reflect on my own privilege and engage in ongoing learning. And now I'd like to introduce you all to Rick Gurley. Rick is a retired long-term care administrator with more than 30 years experience as an administrator, CEO, and is a self-proclaimed lifetime gay man. In his own words, Rick says, my entire life I have loved men. He has spent his entire career working to bring equality and fairness to all people living in care, regardless of race, culture, religion, color, or sexual orientation slash identity. Realizing that the demographics within the long-term care population are constantly changing, Rick created an award-winning multi-year MAD poster project designed to raise staff awareness regarding the need for judgment-free care and acceptance of all people. The poster project was followed by multiple staff education sessions that in return generated many smaller unit discussions on the topics of the MAD posters. The MAD posters told stories and asked care staff questions with multiple choice answers, which provided staff the correct non-judgmental approach, reinforcing the fundamental need for respect and dignity. Rick accomplished all this through the use of his gay lens. And now I'll turn it over to you, Rick, to say a few words before we start our questions. Well, thanks, Max. Um, I'm just gonna lean in because apparently my computer makes me sound really tinny because um, I really do have a deep voice. <laughs> so, okay. Um, First of all, I gotta say, I'm not an expert. I worked 35 years in long-term care. I've run all kinds of care homes, but I'm not really what you would call an expert and I'm just representing myself. Um, so these answers that I give, they're mine, they're basic. There's, you could go into them I mean, years worth of study on lots of stuff. However, I'm just gonna kind of skim through it to give you an idea of what you're looking at in long-term care. Um, I'll be using terms like LGBTQ, I may use gay, I may use homo, I may use queer, I may use any number. I don't mean any offense to anybody. Um, I'm just the way I talk. I'm just being honest with you. Uh, I hope that's okay. I don't mean to offend. Um, however, I will say if I do get a little bit excited, I do tend to have a potty mouth. So that's what they tell me when I'm babysitting. You have a potty mouth. <laughs> anyway, that's what it is. So. Max has got some questions for us. We asked the LGBT community um, from our, com our committee what questions they would have for long-term care. So I'm just gonna ask Max to start us off on our first question and we'll run from there. It's just gonna be fun. Great, thanks Rick. 
So the first question that was uh, that we think we want to start off with is something very basic in terms of looking at long-term care, and that's to explain the difference between retirement uh, residences or homes, long-term mm -hmm. care homes, and old age homes. So those three three different uh, titles or categories that we often hear bantered about. So maybe yeah. let's start, Rick, with the retirement home. What can you tell us about a retirement home? So this is a great question because it's the thing that I keep telling people all the time. That's not long-term care. Retirement is a, is a rental contract that you have for a really, uh, for a room, you can get multiple rooms, you can get fancy ones, you can get less fancy ones, but you're really looking at a retirement um, a residence as a rental place with a landlord and the landlord has the availability to provide you with more services. So, I mean, you can get there's um, you can get any number of services provided to you, provided that you have the ability to pay for them. So, there's no government funding in, in retirement. It's not part of long-term care. There's no formal assessment required, and you can pick literally what you want to afford. For example, you can get a, um, a place that's like truly like the Taj Mahal, if you've got the bucks to pay for it. Or you can rent a small little room in a small house in a small area and you can get your services from them for a much cheaper rate. Um, retirement living provides you with basic supports and kind of it's, it, I would say the difference between long-term care and retirement is that long-term care provides you with convenience. Uh, long-term, pardon me, retirement provides you with convenience, but long-term care provides you with care. So retirement, I would say, you have the ability to choose what you want. In long-term care, you have choice, but it's much more restricted because it's within the parameters of the provision of care. Does that kind of get it, Max, as far as retirement? Yes, I, I think I'm getting a, a clearer picture, Rick. Uh, a residence, a residential uh, home is sort of, um, uh, if I went into a senior's residence, it would be sort of similar to going yeah. into a hotel maybe, um, yeah, where so I've got my own room and my own living quarters, um, go out for communal um, meals, yeah. and that the residents would probably also, not in the time of COVID, but uh, at other times, have all kinds of activities that I could be participating in right. right there, right in the residence. Right. And generally, your retirement home gives you your meals, a little bit of housekeeping, and a little bit of support, and a little bit of programming, as far as, like you said, bingo, going out to the mall, doing that kind of stuff. For absolutely within, generally within the fee that you pay. However, if you require, as you're there in retirement long term, and you start to require more services like medications, or you need assistance in other areas, you pay each time. So for example, if you're in a retirement home and you need to get your meds looked after, you've got a bubble pack and that's how you get your meds. You get that by the way, free from shoppers you can just ask for it um, and they'll do that. Uh, however, you get, you're kind of forgetful and you can't remember to put your morning meds or did I take them already or how come I've got these? So, you might want to then ask that the RPN or the RN come in and give you your medication. Well, that's 10 bucks a pop generally. So if that's twice a day because you have your morning meds and your night meds, that add 20 bucks a day to your rental. So over 31 days, that's a fair price. That's additional to what you pay for your rent. So rental is retirement. How much you get is how much you can afford. So I think that kind of gets it. Okay, thanks, Rick. Maybe yeah. more specifically then about a long-term care home. Ah, so the long-term care home is the place that you go when where you are can no longer support your care needs. So in other words, you could be in a retirement home and need more supports, but the care home or the retirement home, you can't afford them. So you can go into long-term care. Oh, and everybody can afford long-term care. Let me say that again. Everybody can afford long-term care. It's based on your income, not based on your assets. So if you have no income, it's paid, as long as you have an OHIP card. So long-term care is all 
rather there, there are three different types of long-term care. There's private, there's not-for-profit, and there's municipal or cultural um, religious based. So all three fall within the government parameters and they're all funded. They are all go through an assessment process um, and they all have a high need, pardon me, all the residents in long-term care have a need for care. So it's a medical need that you have. So if you're looking at moving into long-term care, it's generally because if you've been in retirement, you can't afford the, or they don't provide the supports. Retirement doesn't do well with non-mobility. So if you can't move from a retirement into the dining room, they're loath to keep you for a long time because then your mobility starts to be become problematic because, for example, you need assistance with toileting, that kind of thing. All of that's in long-term care and it's all covered as soon as you move into long-term care. However, in long-term care, you have 27 different resident rights. So every care home in the province has 27 um, laws, I guess, that they have. I mean, you have the right to dignity, to respect, to um, uh, privacy, to intimacy, to safety, to independence, to lifestyle, to, um, and those are just a few of the 27 that you've got guaranteed by the province. Because again, remember, all long-term care is funded by the province. So that means no matter what care home you go to, the province is the final body that they can come in to either sanction or to approve the care home and the act to have. So the three different types of gain are private, and that's about 57% of, of the care homes are private. Uh, the about 37% are um, not-for-profits, and the 16% approximately is municipal or cultural. So within that process of long-term care, now all of my experience in long-term care was prior to COVID. For some reason, I got lucky. I retired just as COVID came in. Everything changed in long-term care once COVID came in. And it really did change. Um, freedoms became less because of the, the spread and the transmission. However, the care that's provided in long-term care remains the same. And there are lots of positive stories of people who have moved into long-term care who weren't doing well on their own and then moved into long-term care with three stable meals, with a little bit of doctor help and RN support, they're in, they become, they kind of bounce back. So there are positives of moving into long-term care. However, there's also some realities of long-term care. So reality number one, seven out of 10 residents in long-term care are deemed to be living with dementia, seven out of 10. And of that population out of 10, 88.5 or 85% of the people suffer some form of cognitive loss. So that's a reality that you have in long-term care and there's nobody's gonna change that quickly. So the reality is when you move into long-term care, you may well be if you have all of your faculties and your capacities, you are one of the lucky ones in some regards, because you're one of the not fit, you're one of the 15% that aren't suffering a cognitive loss. However, if you are one of those people who can't, who aren't suffering a cognitive loss, you also can't lock your bedroom door. So if you happen to go down to the dining room and you're having your lunch and come back and your stuff is all moved around in your room, and that happens on a regular basis, you can't lock your room. So that is a huge, huge change for people to realize right off the bat. You can have your own sense of privacy to some degree, it's guaranteed, but it doesn't mean that your room becomes private because anyone can wander in. Many times at night in long-term care, people will be sleeping comfortably and someone will climb in with them. They don't mean it, uh, pardon me. 
they may not mean anything by it. They simply want some company and they crawl in with some. Uh, it is disconcerting for families and for people who are living in long-term care. You can't lock your door. It becomes then a communal space. And what I like to tell people about long-term care is that there's no commonality in long-term care except the need for care. So I once had a, I had a, I had a great old guy who moved in. He was just, he, he needed a bath so bad. We gave him like a soap for four hours and peroxide on it. However, he, uh, he lived in a Hells Angels house and his kids were Hells Angels people. And when they came to visit, the home went crazy because all the Hells Angels people pulled up. They were lovely people. But when something went missing in the home, they all assumed it was the Hells Angels because the home is open to everybody. You can come into a long-term care home. You can't lock your door if you're a resident. And yet anybody's nephew, niece, friends, or others can come to visit the next door neighbor in your room, on your court, or in your unit. And that leaves your room wide open. So long-term care, the difference is you can't stay where you are because you need more care than what your current living situation provides. And that's the difference. Retirement, you decide, hmm, I think I'd like to have a little bit of convenience. I don't want to do my laundry anymore. Matter of fact, I'm not good at it. Never was. Just saying. Um, however, and I don't cook so good. I'm just eating toast now. So I move into retirement. You decide. In long-term care, you can't just walk up to the care home, knock on the door and say, okay, I'm ready. I want to move in. And that's not the process. So that's kind of long-term care in a nutshell. Yeah. I think you're giving us a, a, a fairly clear picture, Rick. And we'll look at the process of how we can get into a long-term yeah. care when we need to in, in a few questions from now. But let's go to the third category that was that we mentioned already, the old age home. How does that fit oh. in to, to senior residences and long-term care? So uh, old age homes are what used to be called nursing homes. Is I mean, basically it's just a title. Um, in Vancouver, when I ran a home in Burnaby in uh, New Westminster on the edge, um, the care home there decided that they wanted to keep what they had within their original structure of 1927 when they opened the home, first home in BC. They called themselves the old people's home. And so when the home was adopted into long-term care and they got the funding, they kept the title. They named their, their building, but they kept the old people's home. So the same with nursing home. You'll often see a nursing home category slapped on the end of a long-term care home. So the title really, it's just, it's like cemetery or graveyard, you know, like doesn't really, whatever they think sounds more appealing at the time. However, I would say the difference is it doesn't matter. If it's funded by the government, it's long-term care. So if you know it's it's ministry funded and they all have like a ministry funding a logo on them. Um, then you'll know that's long term care. Nursing homes, old age homes, old people's homes, just the title there. Right. It's just kind of confusing if you're not in it. But if you know it's, it's funded and it's regulated and it's assessed by the ministry, long term care. Right. Th thanks, Rick. Yeah. S somebody asked the question. Are the residents, and you sort of alluded to a little bit, are, are the residents today in long-term care different than the residents have been in the in the past years ago? Yo. Yes. The answer to that is absolutely. Uh, higher care need by far. Much higher dementia um, ratios and cognitive impairments or losses for sure. Um, so I can explain this better in, if I were to give you an example of a Christmas celebration. So years ago in Vancouver, we used to run the, um, the, the Christmas party and we had, we'd have the band come in and we'd do the meal first. Then they would do a little bit of choral singing and we'd have choirs come in. Cause again, I was trying to fundraise. So we'd make money off the Christmas event. 
and residents were all down and you'd have the kids there and they'd be running around and the parents would be there and we'd serve wine, we'd charge them. We'd, we'd have a, I mean, we had a band. It was fantastic. People were up dancing. By eight o'clock, the tables were cleared. The kitchen staff went home. I'd hang around and make presentations to different things for, oh, you know, the best whatever. By 10 o'clock, the band would be struck, still going. By 12 o'clock, I'd go home. I, I would be beat, but the residents wouldn't. Many of the residents had gone to bed, but many were still up with their families, talking, laughing, having fun, drinking acclimate, just having a great time. So that was 1980, 86, around there, 90. Today, we have the same celebration and we have the meal, families come. By the time the dessert is out, we're doing a sing song with the band, but by seven o'clock, 60% of the residents have asked to go to bed. And by eight o'clock, you could roll a bowling ball down the hallway and nobody's up. It's not because the staff don't want them up, it's not because the band wouldn't play. It's because residents are too sick, Matt. They're just too sick. They've been up since four o'clock, getting their hair done, getting their best outfits on, looking their very best that they can because it's Christmas and they want to celebrate this event. But by the time they finish their meal, everything is, is gone. They are, you can see them. They just start to, to wilt. And they're trying to listen and pay attention to what's being said by the little girl who's sitting there telling them their story of school or whatever. And you can see they're, they're exhausted. And so the staff will say like, Rick, would you like to go to bed now? Yes, 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 I, I wanna go to bed. So the difference to me is the general health that the, that the residents move in with and the severity of their illnesses very severe illnesses now moving in, a great deal of care required. A large percentage of people have multiple health concerns. So long-term care, most, in my opinion, years ago, uh, for example, in Vancouver, I had an old guy who had a 1965 440 um, Chrysler that he drove in, fabulous, two-door. He washed it every second day in the parking lot. There's nobody in long-term care today that I know of that's driving their car and parking it in the parking lot with the staff. So it's huge, hugely different. Rick, that, that explains a conversation my mother had a few years ago with her, her social worker in Montreal. My mother was uh, 93 at the time. And she was- Congratulations. She, thanks. I'll, I'll say thanks on her behalf. Um, and she was having a conversation with her social worker saying she was tired of being in the kitchen and, and, and various things and that she thought maybe it was time for her to go into, uh, into a home, as she called it. And because she had memories of a particular home that she wanted to go to, but she had memories of what it was like 10 years prior when, when my aunt had been there. And, and it was quite interesting because her social worker much to my mother's disdain, told her that she wouldn't qualify. Um, and my mother was, 93. But, I'm, but I'm 93. And her social worker was saying, but you don't qualify yet because you don't need that kind of care. And, exactly. my, and I remember my mother calling me after the, her conversation and saying, what kind of care is she talking about? I'm 93. I'm at the end of my life. Why can't I go there? You know? right. So that's, yeah. that's, that sums it up perfectly, Matt. A lot of people think with an age requirement that entitles me to move in. It doesn't. Right. I'm sorry exactly. to say. Exactly. I had a friend who told me the other day, the only people that they're admitting right now are hospital admissions. Because of mm. course, hospital gets a whole lot more money to look after a long-term care. So the system wants to flush them out, get them in, pardon me. The system would like to transfer them into the, in a more appropriate care setting is what they would say. So yeah, makes it hard. So Rick, when should somebody nowadays start thinking about long-term care? Um, right now, <laughs> no, really. <laughs> Seriously, I'll, I, I can use a little bit of I'm tired of cooking. Should I start yeah. thinking? <laughs> yeah, um, 
to be honest, yeah, you should. And I think you should because I think it's important for you to know what long-term care is so that you can know then what the expectations are so that you know, like your poor 93-year-old mother, bless her heart, thinking I'm entitled now for someone to, to move into long-term care because I believe it is what it was when I toured that home in 1972. It is not. Um, so you need to start thinking about it right now. You need to start thinking about what you can do to prepare yourself to expose yourself to what long-term care really is. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think you can understand the realities of what long-term care is until you've actually had some exposure to it. And as we grow older, we think, oh, well, this is what that, this is the panacea to some degree. Once I move into long-term care, uh, no, no, that it's not, it's not that. It's not that I'm saying it's the halls of terror, like the Toronto Star tries to tell you it is. Um, however, it's, it's not what people think of as a retirement residence at all. It is a care home. They have 24-hour RNs, they all have a medical director, they all have RPNs and RNs, they all have highly trained PSWs with expanding duties and responsibilities. And so now with COVID, there's also now a new term that's been brought in for people who haven't maybe been trained to be uh, PSWs or personal support workers or healthcare aides and they're using them in an untrained capacity so that which only elevates them the level that the PSW is at. So because there's nobody, they have nobody. Right. The reality is right now, if you knock on the door and say, I wanna to go to work in long-term care, you're gonna get hired. Right. You know. So Rick, let, let's talk a little bit now, if you can, about the process. So let's say I'm at the point where I'm feeling I need that care, or my family members are feeling I need that care, that yeah. kind of care. Um, what's the process? Yeah, I kind of alluded to the fact you can't knock on the door and say, hello, hello, I want, I want to move in. Um, and you, you can't. You just can't. Um, there, the, the process that I would suggest that you take is that you need to be professionally assessed. So if you have a professional assessment done that determines that you are applicable to long-term care or acceptable to the level of care of long-term care, then that's when you get in. And the way you get that assessment is the simplest process that I have for you would be ask your doctor. I mean, we all know or have a bit of a relationship, or hopefully we do, with our physician. And so you say to your general practitioner, I think I need long-term care, or can you direct me how I would find out if I do? And your doctor will be able to help you in that regard. Um, maybe Glenn can pop up a, um, a link to the local health integration network. And now the local health integration network is where we used to go when it was considered as the continuing care access center. So the continuing care access centers kind of got axed out and they brought in the new local health integration networks. Uh, there's, I think, how many in Ottawa, um, in Ontario of that, there's a number Ottawa falls within the Champlain. Uh, there's the Southeast Lynn is where Brockville is. So within your area, that's where you have Okay, we're jumping around. Thanks, Glenn. So within your area, there's different groups, but I would go um, to the to the physician and say, how do I how do I get into the to the long term care? They're going to then set you up with an assessment, and the assessment's going to be done. Once you get the assessment done, and it tells you that you are acceptable to move into long term care, then you start the process. What will happen is you'll get a, a placement coordinator or a social worker or somebody professional from the access center or from the LIN who will then direct you to, they'll give you a list and say, pick on the list of homes in your area or within the province, because you can go anywhere in the province. Um, you can pick the homes that you want to pick. Of those, I think you get to pick six, used to be three I think, and of those, you rate them what's your first, second, third, fourth choice. 
However, once you've made your choices of what they are, you submit those to the access center, that's when you start to go on the waiting list to get in. You're not on the waiting list. Nobody even knows you exist until you give them the six homes that you want to be in. And if you're in crisis, the, there are three levels of crisis. The highest level is hospital. The second highest is crisis in the community. And the third is in the community assessed and needing care. So number one, two, and three is who gets the first bedroom or, or, or admission. Um, once you've uh, placed yourself on the list, I would like to say it's only going to be a, a matter of so long until you get chosen, but I don't know. Um, I know for a fact that Carlton Lodge, I think, has 400 names on the list, uh, the last I knew, um, and many homes have long waiting lists. However, the sooner you get your name on the list, if you're assessed in needing, the quicker you're going to get in. It's that easy. So once an opening comes available, they'll say to you, of your six choices, oh, well, actually, we have a room in the sixth of your choices, your least favorite place. So you're like, well, do I have to decide right now? Yeah. You got 24 hours, make your choice. And if you decide, you know what? I think I'm okay. You jump off the list, you go right to the bottom and you start again. So it's not like you can stay up in the high priority. You drop down to the bottom and then from there you get at it. If you say no, you're on the bottom. If you say yes and you take that and you're, and you're like, eh, it's a long way away. I'm up in uh, Calgary or um, someplace far away. And you're like, I don't want to be here within the province. Um, so uh, Calabogie, for example, or the Miramichi up in Petawawa, Pembroke. Um, and you're like, I don't, this is too far from my family to visit. I don't want to be here. I want to move. Yeah, you can. You then say, I want to go on a transfer list and you can move from that home to another home. But before you do, I would suggest wait for a bit, get to know the home you're in, give it a chance and tell your family to come visit you. What's it matter? Um, if you have your favorite place that you want to be at, my question to you would be, why is it your favorite? You want to pick a home based on what you believe has the best atmosphere and the best care. It need not be the fanciest place available. And that is, I got to say, that is worth its weight in gold. If I could give you a tip right now, it would be, it is not the fancy home that you're looking for. It is the home that makes you feel like you're home. Like you can live here, like you can be who you are in your underwear. You know what I mean? That's what's important to me. Um, don't worry about money. Don't worry about money at all. The ministry will pay for any, uh, it, your income is your income. So let's say you don't make enough money to cover the cost of the rent in long-term care. Rent, I mean, uh, the monthly fee. If you don't have enough money to pay that, that's okay, man. The ministry will pay the difference between, so the home gets paid, they'll get paid, and you get to keep a little bit of your OSPN or your your OS your OAC and your CPP. So you get to keep about 125 bucks a month, so you can use that to buy tobacco or liquor or, or hand cream or your nails done or whatever it is you want to do. So even if you don't have enough money to pay, you don't become without any money, you still get to keep some. It's based again on income, not asset. So my favorite is I have an apartment building that doesn't make me any money. Do I have to sell it to move into long-term care? Nope, you don't. If it's not making you any money, it's not, wet and it's not income. So yes, you can keep your Lexus. So Rick, one of the questions in the chat, um, I'm yeah, going to okay. interject interject right now is one of up. the questions says uh, asks um what are the options for low or no income when they are not and it's in quotation marks qualified for long-term care is anybody ever not qualified for long-term care yeah um so qualifications for long-term care is not based on finance so no no one no one is ever 
not applicable for long-term care simply because you have no money provided you have an OHIP card. If you've got an OHIP number, you are good to go. However, if you're not applicable to long-term care because you don't meet the requirements, then that becomes an issue where you drop back a step and go back to retirement homes. And retirement homes are a whole kettle of fish or a ball of wax that's very different than long-term. Long-term care in that, so let's say, because I'm not sure what the, you don't qualify. If you don't qualify because you don't meet the standards or the requirements to move into long-term care, then you're not applicable. Bottom line. If you don't have enough money to stay in where you are, then uh, there are many options that you can, you can look at, but they are not long-term care based. If you think that you're not applicable for long-term care, because I think the, the prices for long-term care start for about what, 1850 uh, is your income that you, is the price that you would need. I have it someplace, Max, what it is. Um, however, if that's the cost and you can't afford that, the ministry pays the difference. So they'll take your OS, whatever you've got. Yeah, it's $18.91 a month or $62 a day. It's $22.80 for a semi-private and it's $27.61 for, or $88 a day for a private room. So the nice thing is in that category of applicabilities, the basic rate, which was the 18, almost $1,900 a month, if you don't have like your whole income is only 1300 let's say. That's the 1200 a month. So you make 1200 a month. You submit, the, you go to the care home. You don't even have to fill out a form. You don't have to know anything. All you got to do is give all your papers over to the care home and tell them, sign over, that they fill out the forms for you and, you, and they will submit it to the ministry and they will make sure, and they'll do that because they want to get paid and the ministry will make up the difference and they'll set you up with um, like a petty cash fund or um, you know, a, 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 a penny fund. So you've got about 125 bucks a month. And in long-term care, there's no cost. Like they're, all your incontinence products are paid, all your soaps are paid, all your foods are paid, all your drinks are paid, all, everything's paid um, except for cable TV, Often care homes charge for that. Internet, if you want the internet, or your telephone. And any sundries that you would choose. So, I mean, I've had many gentlemen who wanted whiskey. So we don't pay for whiskey in long-term care, uh, but it will be administered to you in a doctor's order. And when the nurse comes around, she'll give you um, the whiskey if it's on your doctor's order. So yes, you can have it but we control it because you are so sick now. Your medications are so high. Your complications are such. But if I could, the only way you wouldn't meet requirements for long-term care is everything about care or ability, but not about finance. You can be, I have had people who waited until they got a health card. And then on the day they got their health card, they moved, they got on the line to say, I can't afford to live here anymore. Can I get this paid for? And the ministry will fill out the forms, we'll send them in and we guarantee you, you nobody has ever lost a room because they couldn't pay for it. I've moved many people from a private room because they couldn't afford the private room and put them into a room, a ward room or a basic rate room. So basic rate rooms used to be, imagine, four beds in a room. Now, the ministry said after COVID, it's two beds per room. So when I quoted you the costs, I quoted a semi-private, a private, and a basic, which used to be four beds. So what the ministry has done, and this is just me saying it, I'm no expert, but they kind of took away the semi-private room because now all beds, all basics, are two beds in a room. And often the newer builds are such that they put the bathroom in between, they put one bed on this side and one bed on that side and a little curtain in between. It's really quite private, even though it's a ward or a basic rate. So they've kind of taken away the semi, the semis. 
that we used to have. Right. I think I think Rick, you know, you've alluded to, and as uh, somebody in the chat room, that I think COVID has brought out a whole lot of other issues and things. And and one of the things that we hear a lot about in the media, because as a result of COVID, has been the regulation of of uh, long term care homes, and a lot of people's concerns about that. Uh, I know that we're, we really said we were focusing on pre-COVID. Right. COVID has brought a lot of other issues, which hopefully longer term we are gonna be, are gonna be dealt with uh, in the long-term care homes. But can you give us a little bit of a, a short version of what the regulations really do look like? That's my dog, in case you heard my dog. How, I think my husband's home. However, um, so the regulations, it might be interesting to know that there are more long-term care regulations than there are hospital regulations. So within, hang on just a sec. We take a pause, everybody can get a coffee. Yeah. No, I don't. no, no, it's my dog. My <laughs> dog's barking up a storm. I don't know, it may be my neighbor. Anyway, so long-term care, so there are so many regulations in long-term care, it exceeds the regulations of acute care, which is astronomical. Long-term care has regulations for how, how hot or cold the water can be. They have regulations for the humidity in a room. They have regulations for everything, for the times to which you can, you can serve, the temperatures that they're served at, how often you're taking the temperatures of the food that you're serving. I mean, there is, in my mind, if you were to ask me, when the ministry makes more regulations, it's simply a case of wash my hands of the real problem. And if you were to ask me, what has COVID taught us? It is that regulations do nothing to improve care. They improve regulations. And by that, I simply mean 1989, we used to have a process where we had ministry advisors. Every care home gets, gets an annual inspection done and you get to find out whether or not you're good or you're not. And those are posted on the website. And sometimes people get what's called a ministry finding based on the fact that they didn't follow the rule. But sometimes the rules just don't work. And so by not following, I used to tell my board lots of times, we'll take the hit. In other words, we'll take the, the, the non-finding because I truly believe that this is the better thing to do for the individual. However, if you were to look at what, the, from my point of view, and it's no expert point of view, I would say we need to change the atmosphere and the culture within the ministry. The ministry has a policing culture right now. We used to have advisors. So the advisor would come in and say to you, hey, Rick, I know you've got Maxine's mother down on that unit and she is sweet, but she's got a problem with whatever. And what we were thinking was, we'd advise you to consider the following thing. So you would go, actually, we didn't think about that. But really, that would work? Okay, let's give that a try. Today, what they do is they walk in they don't talk to you. They don't talk. They talk to lots of people. They don't want to hear from you until they want to hear from you. They review. They walk through. They'll give you a finding for not having a name tag on. God, heaven's sake. However, they, they walk into the care home and look through to find out where the problem is. Then they write the problem up. They throw it on the administrator's desk and they walk away. And they say, fix that. And I'm like, my response used to be, well, yeah, I get it. I get it. What am I supposed to do about that? I mean, I can't, how do you meet every, so everybody has the right to a lifestyle choice. I mean, that's right in the, the regulation. So if I'm a nudist, <laughs> you know, how, how do you meet that lifestyle choice for me? So am I, am I right? Are my rights going to be trod? downtrodden? Absolutely. Am I going to feel that I am being oppressed? Absolutely. Probably. If you had advisors rather than police, 
the police mentality of giving you the finding or the infraction and walking away, in my opinion, is simply saying it's your problem. What I think we need to be looking at is saying, what is our solution? Doesn't that just, doesn't that just like hit you from a common sense in the gut kind of response? Yeah, that makes more sense. You travel as, an, as a compliance inspector, you travel around the whole province. You get to see all kinds of places that are great. And maybe something that somebody's using in Toronto at the butterfly unit or whatever is fantastic and I need to adopt that. Then tell me, tell me how to do it, help me. But simply hitting me and coming back and hitting me again, because the truth of it is, if you don't get it right, the only one who loses their job is the administrator. They put you in what's called enforcement because you're bad and you can't solve the problem. So you must be a bit of a dully. So yeah, again, punitive. The whole process is set up on punitive responses. So is it regulated? Absolutely. Is there room for more regulations? Oh, hell yeah, you could write as many as you want. Do we need them? What we need is people with solutions, people who are creative, people who can take what we see as a problem and say, I know this is gonna kind of crush a few of your standards, but I think if we put this in place, it would work really well. And by that, I mean, the old guy that I had in Vancouver, who liked to wash his car every day, got a little bit addled. He didn't quite remember where he was halfway through washing his car. So we had to say to him, we, we can't wash the car anymore. And the poor old guy, I felt bad for him. So I had the car driven up on the yard, put inside the lock, inside the fence in area on the unit and put a hose out and told him, go wash the car now on the grass. The car sank into the grass at Vancouver. I mean, it's raining all the time. I mean, something you just don't think about. <laughs> However, Nick, I think what I'm hearing you say is that it's not so much the regulations, the written up rule, right. so to speak, right. but right. Rather, rather it's the actions. What can we do to solve them? And that's not going to come necessarily from a formal regulation. regulation. Yeah. And, and I agree, I would still though, I would caveat that to say that we have enough regulations, mm -hmm. not that we need more, we have tons already. The difficulty is meeting them. It, it's and, about, it's, it's sounding to me like it's about, uh, solutions are about client care and looking, at, and looking at the individual people, seeing what they need and trying to fit it into the system as, as it stands. There, there is a question on the chat and, sure. um, uh, participants asking, and, it, and it's a good question because we both of have alluded to it, what medical slash physical conditions would make a person qualify or not qualify for entry into a long-term care home? So that's an assessment question and the assessments are done by assessment professionals. So I'm not one. So I can't really give you an honest, full, truthful answer, except to say that I'm not an expert and this is what I believe. Fair enough? Yeah. So no. generally, it's toileting, it's mobility, and it's cognitive loss. So one of the things, um, you can do a mini mental. You can look it up on the internet and do it. One of the questions on the mini, on the mini mental is draw, draw a clock that says it's five after three. And then put the hands on the clock. So that is one test that people do all the time as well as what's the year, who's the prime minister, what day is it, what day of the month is it, what's the date, that kind of stuff, where you're just doing from mental capacity. But if you're encopretic or enuretic, if you have mobility um, loss, and long-term care in many ways is we're in the business of lifting and moving and toileting. And if you really think about it, that is what we do all the time. We lift you up to put you to bed. We lift you up to take you to the toilet. We lift you up to put you in your wheelchair, to take you to the dining room, to bring you back, to lift you up, to put you back in bed, to lift you up, to put you in a tub, to lift you up and take you out of the tub. So what would qualify you to move into long-term care? 
really depends on what the assessor has for their standards. But from my perspective, you can generally tell what that is based on when a, a retirement home would no longer be able to keep you. And that would be based on your aneuretic and credit and mobility. And so, and cognitive loss. Um, those would be the main things. However, I will say that long retirement residences, when they've got a good paying customer, will bend over backwards to keep someone who is already at a level where they could have been in long-term care, but they don't go into long-term care because they don't need to. The retirement residents will, will support that. Because again, the room's full, the rent's paid, we need the money. And, and I know that that holds true for one of my mother's friends um, who who, who's in her 90s and, and is in a senior's residence and does have a, a good degree of dementia However, right. if she has the finances to have a private carer in the residence, and, and, and so she's, she is being, her family is able to avoid, sort of not have her look at long-term care and keep right. her in the residence. And I think what you're saying holds true for my mother in terms of um, when a social worker was assessing her, when my mother was saying a few years ago mm -hmm. that she wanted to go into care, um, and and the, the, her social worker was saying on her list of things, my mother, you know, can go to the washroom on her own and she's not incontinent. She can get in and out of bed on her own and she can actually, you know, pour herself her glass of water, et cetera, et cetera. And she can move around her, even though she moves with difficulty with her walker, but nevertheless, she still can move around in her apartment. So yeah. that, that put her in, not, not in need of the kind of care. Right. Uh, again, nutrition. I forgot that one, Max. That was really smart. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. yeah. If you can't feed yourself or you can't pour a cup of tea, you know what I mean? Or, you, or you're at physical risk. Mm -hmm. If you're at risk, I mean, you would pour the, the boiling water over your hand or put your hand into a frying pan. Right. Like at that point, we were telling my mother that we didn't want her using the stove. Right. Um, because she also had, had some deficit in her eyesight. Okay, so for safety see. reasons, we didn't want her using the stove but she was perfectly capable of using the microwave. For example. Yeah, right. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so the, the, those were the kinds of things. Um, we're very, very close to the end, uh, like oh. reaching an hour. I know, sorry, Rick. I know Rick, Rick and I could go on probably for another hour, but we won't. Um, we, and we have other questions. Um, however, there's one question that I wanted to make sure we still have time for um, and uh, try to make it a shorter answer, Rick. But in terms of myself, for example, being a part of the LGBT community, if I have reached the point where I'm wanting to, or needing to go into long-term care, perhaps I can or can't make the decision on my own, but my family members may be making that decision for me. Right. But for me, it would be really important that I'm in a home um, uh, that, that's LGBTQ friendly in some way. Okay. So. so so the question then is, how do I know if my care home that I choose will be LGBTQ friendly or can I, can I live a queer lifestyle? Correct. Right, okay. Um, so again, within the ministry, they have written down that um, you're, you're entitled to have your own lifestyle choice in long-term care. And that's about as good as you're gonna get that I can find anywhere written down to say that it's entitled, it's enshrined, it's your right. And, and that, yeah. like, Rick, sorry, that's the Bill of Rights. Correct? That's right. That falls within the Residence Bill of Rights, and you can look that up. It's on the web. Um, how, and it's like all inclusive. Like basically, you're entitled to everything. However, I would say that it's difficult for a care home. Uh, for example, I have never been in a meeting where the word homosexual came up. I have rarely heard anyone talk about the same sex anything in a professional context. Um, I've had care homes that we've talked about where they had difficulties of two males together or two females, um, those types of things, but it's rare. So my suggestion is, first of all, all care homes are fluid. So it, it depends on who runs it and who works there. And that changes. So in many ways, it's up to us. Now. So what I would suggest is you need to be vocal. You need to walk into the care home and ask them and say, 
or talk to them on the phone and say, I'm an LGBTQ woman. I want to know that when I move in, I won't suffer any loss or any indignity. Um, what rights do you have enshrined for me? Uh, what policies do you have that will guarantee me? So if, if I have an issue, and so you, you would want to talk to them about if I feel that I'm being harassed or bullied in any way, who could I go to? And has this ever happened before? Uh, do you have any LGBTQ people in your home? Now, what's interesting in that question, for example, is I gave a talk once to a care group that had 1,200 residents and zero LGBTQ people. And I said, well, there's 120 people approximately that haven't told you. And the reason they haven't is because you haven't created a culture where they feel safe in exposing themselves in this regard. And that is the truth. Um, I was at another meeting one time and people said, oh, well, we're going to put it right on the list. We're going to ask people, so are you a homosexual? <laughs> and I was like, oh, yes, yes, oh, for sure, I'm going to answer that. <laughs> stop, stop. You're not, nobody's going to answer that question until they've had a chance to find out whether you are the person they want to disclose to. Come on, be honest. So build a rapport. And the best way that I can do that is you need to start calling people now and telling them this is your expectation and know what their response is going to be. So it's sometimes not what they say, it's what they don't say. And when they say, oh, yes, we have a flag at the front door, uh, my response to that would be, and what difference does that make? How have you found that impacting care? Does that make a non-judgmental approach to, to care? What would happen if I were harassed by one of your staff or one of your residents? And what if that resident was demented? Would I be expected to put up with that? And the trick to that question is, or the answer, is that in long-term care, if you're demented and you hit somebody, we have processes to extinguish that behavior. So if you are in long-term care and someone chooses to use words to make you feel unsafe and safety is a right, then what are they gonna do about it? And if they tell you, well, there's nothing we can do, they're demented, then they are lying because they have processes to take, remember, that they won't take uh, for physical. So mental anguish that makes me feel unsafe because he keeps telling me I'm a queer and he's gonna kill me. I mean, what? And you're not, what? You think I'm supposed to put up with this? No, they won't. And they don't have to. Like they don't have to right now because we're not expecting them to, but I will. <laughs> no, I will. I'll, I'll be on them like tar on a roof. So if, if I'm in long-term care and I have my wits about me and-, and Or even if you don't. And, and I've noticed something, I'm gonna say, call Rick. <laughs> no, no, you're gonna go right to the charge nurse on that unit. You're gonna go to the PSW and talk to them. You're gonna go to everybody. You're gonna work your way right up until you get to the administrator. And if the administrator doesn't give you a good answer, you're gonna go, George, pull up the number. 1-800-COME-HELP-ME, God darn. And the ministry has a complete formal process for coming in and assessing what was done for your complaint. And I gotta tell you right now, there are very few people that are complaining because they aren't being treated well because of their sexual orientation. And that is changing. We are the gay and gray, the wave that's coming in and they are not prepared. They are not talking about us. They aren't ready and they don't know what to do. I, I, I think, Rick, this really speaks to two <laughs> things for me. One is how important our long -term, how important our long-term care committee is within OSPN and the work that we're trying to do and aiming to do. And certainly, I think we'll be able to hopefully do much better once COVID has decreased enough where things are more open and we can get into places. Things like OSPN looking at at training, which I know that uh, the OSPN is now going to do to start doing again, how important and crucial those those elements are within our within our LGBT plus community um, in order to try to ensure that there are safe places. On a personal level, it's also reminding me of I've had I, I have two children and I have had those quote unquote difficult conversations with them about 
about my my care that I would want or not want. Um, you you know, know, one, my daughters have my power of attorney and, and they can speak for me and they know what, what I would or would not want. However, one of the things I'm realizing from, from speaking with you and thinking about this now, the one conversation I have not had with them is that if I'm no longer verbal and they are going to be put, placing me or I'm going to go live in a long-term care home, I need them to know how important it is for me that it is gay affirming and that the the home has avenues that they are open to um, all those kinds of discussions. So now I have my homework cut out for me. I've got to set out a list of questions that I can give my children that they can ask should we reach a point where I, I'm having to go into a long-term care home. But So the thing that I would add to that is we are not, and I do not want, uh, private areas for LGBTQ people. Don't build me a pink floor. Don't, I mean, honest to Christ, I would go crazy in that. I want to be in with everybody else. I've lived my whole life with everybody else. I want the babies to be there. I want the big lumberjack walking by. I want the pretty lady coming by. You know what I mean? I want all of that. I don't want to be in an environment where you're simply saying, this is where the homos go. Because to me, I mean, and seriously, right now, the ministry is giving money away to the Rakai Center to build two floors for the homosexuals. Well, maybe if you want to build a gay ghetto, you'll go right ahead. But my process is going to be, we need to build gay areas that are friendly to everybody, including people of different faiths, as ethnic origins, religions, backgrounds, beliefs. I don't care. Everybody should be enshrined with the same rights. And just because I'm queer doesn't mean I'm supposed to go into that floor because I honest to God, I got to say, I might not like it. <laughs> and I, am I supposed to? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> if you were there, Max, I'd, I'd want to go with you. Rick, Rick, I want to be on your floor. Rick, if you're Rick, not I'm talking, ready to, I'll talk for you. <laughs> Rick, I'm ready to vote for you. You're so passionate. Go, one for office. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want me. I'm too mouthy. Uh, I, I, I will I will share with, with all of the rest of you, and I hope, Rick, this is okay, that as Rick and I um, talked about question, the questions that had come into us and, what, and how we were going to proceed today, um, one of the things he did say to me was, well, if you were, if you were, um, I, I would go into a long-term care home if you were there, and I said the same, I said, it felt the same way about Rick, but then he said, but if he, if he was beside if I was beside some really nice looking man, that he would want to change rooms with me. And I, and, and I said to him that the only way I would change rooms with him is if there's a nice looking woman beside him. <laughs> so yeah. on, on that cheerful note, I'm going to say that we're a bit over the hour even, and I thank That's everybody. Fun, I want to thank everybody for having come. Uh, a big thank you to Rick, of course, um, for his expertise in this area and sharing his views and his humor with us and, and the stories, because I think it's the stories that help make, a, make it far more real for all of us. And um, thank you for those people who put questions in. And I will say again, one more time, if you have any other questions that you don't feel we address during, um, during this time, but you want to uh, send it to Rick, you can send it via our, our committee email, which I will tell you again, is ltccospn, all lowercase by the way, at gmail.com. So that's the initials of long-term care committee and then ospn at gmail.com. So feel free to, to send us an email. Um, Rick, I know we'll be happy to try to answer any of those questions. And a uh, big thank you as well to Glenn for making this uh, wonderful um, graphics that is up here on, I hope it's on my screen, so I hope it's on all your screens with the various um, names and websites and phone numbers uh, that we provided for Glenn to do. So thank you, Glenn. And again, a big thank you to Glenn, not just for today and the technology that he's uh, helped with the technology here and with helping us put this together, um, but really Glenn for all of your support and help in all of the virtual programming that's been going on for OSPN members um, through this COVID time, which does not appear to be over yet. And so on, on that note, I hope people that have questions in the chat 
that we were able to address those. I was trying to read it and be able to incorporate it. But again, if we have it, please feel free to, to send an email. And if people have more questions and we want to do this again, I mean, Max and I'd be happy to do it if you got more stuff, right? Right. Yes, we didn't. We didn't even address all of the questions that no, we had come up with. We didn't so. get some of the good ones because Rick <laughs> likes to talk. Somebody else. Somebody else that worked with Rick told me just remember <laughs> Maxine. You have to rein them in. But to be quite honest, I haven't been able to figure out how to do that, so I just let them go. And uh, it was very enjoyable. Thanks again, Rick. Thanks, Thank Glenn. Max. And I'm thanks glad. all of you for, for having attended today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, Rick, I think it was. I think it was okay.